So I am Roz Kaplan. I'm the director of the, uh, what am I the director of? Today, <laughs> the Liberal Arts and Adults 55 Plus program, which is part of the continuing studies program here at uh, SFU. And um, it is my distinct pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker tonight. And I want to tell you that I think this is a record crowd for this kind of an event. So I want to thank all of you for coming back. And those of you who are joining us for the first time, thank you for coming out. Because what we're talking about today is community, the power of community, and the importance of it, and how it will make all of us um, live better, live stronger, and live healthier. And so um, I'm hoping that you will take advantage of what you hear and what you learn today to continue with some sort of path of activism to begin planning for some of the different ideas you will learn tonight, as well as those of you who are at the conference, to, were at the conference today and tomorrow. So um, Charles Durrett came to my mind um, by a colleague of mine, Catherine McManus, who did not stop talking about the importance, and Angie Wong. Um, we had a lot of coffees and, and lunches, actually. Um, and it started with this book, which Charles wrote. And um, we have a copy available if anyone wants to part with 30 bucks. Um, but this book is the Bible of co-housing. And co-housing is one idea of community, and it's a beautiful idea. And uh, Chuck will talk more about it. But it is the notion that we live together, we create intentional communities, and there's other ways of doing it, and um, we'll talk about that. But in addition to that, we, have, we are offering a class in the fall through the uh, Adults 55 Plus program. Uh, this, it's an experiential workshop, and it's going to take you through what are some of the decisions, what are some of the thought processes you need to go through as you age or family members age. So um, uh, there are flyers on the table. Be sure to take one. And when you go to our website, you can sign up for more information. We don't want to drop the conversation here. It's very important to many of us that we continue the conversation after the conference today. So for those of how many of you have heard of Charles Durrett? See, OK, so do I need to even introduce him? Did you, you didn't even see the, it's like two thirds of the crowd. For those of you who don't know about him, he is really um, a man who is interested in more than putting up buildings, although he does that with his partner and wife. But he is, his whole idea is building community and making people feel good about it and involving people in the process. And he's going to talk about all that today. So in addition to being an author, um, he is highlighted in a new book, which I have up in my office, um, several of his projects, um, and is working currently with a number of programs here in, in BC, as well as um, other places in the states. So his firm is very well known. Um, it's McCammett and Durrett, Architect, Durrett Architects. And it's very no, well known for its affordable and community-based multifamily housing, co-housing, mixed-use neighborhoods. And he's not necessarily a proponent of senior co-housing, but of co-housing for both multi-generational and senior. You'll have a chance to ask questions. He's got a great presentation. And let's give a warm Vancouver welcome to Chuck Durrett. Thank you. Wow, thank you guys very much. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to do, uh, this is going to be like a three-part thing. The first part, I'm going to describe what I think is the problem. Um, the second part is what I think is one of the antidotes, i.e. community. I mean, I, I, I very much am a, a believer in community, as um, Roz just mentioned. And then third, <clears throat> I would like to engage you guys because, um, you know, the challenge of community in our early 21st century cultures is the fear of um, community-based environments, the fear of knowing our, our neighbor or not knowing our neighbor, but having a neighbor 
that we actually commune with at some basic level. You know, I'm always amazed how many people get, you know, very much the wrong idea about co-housing, like it's some hippie thing or something. And, um, and um, you know, when I re really look at it deeply, it's very much a settled, you know, environment. I just finished the very first project in the U.S., where over half of the residents were Republicans, for example, which was very, very odd for me, actually. Um, I don't have a, didn't have a lot in common with that group. But on the, on the one hand, you know, this idea of community, it's timeless. It's, it crosses all borders when it comes to, to the extent that it can support our very, our, our well-being and, and, and the rest. So um, let me start off with what I think the problem is. Boy, you know, um, let me tell you. Let me tell you. With a, uh, start with a little story first. A f few months ago, I was working in my office till midnight on a, on a common house to a new co-housing community. And there's this young guy in the office named John, and he we were he was in there with me, and and he happened to have a band on the side. And I said, John, how is it that you named your band the Poison Squirrels? The, the Poison Squirrels. What's up with that? And he says, well, I started watching Mr. Rogers when I was five, and it wasn't until 12 that I realized that he wasn't saying, good morning, poison squirrels. <laughs> so I thought to myself, boy, this guy really needed co-housing. <laughs> I mean, he needed someone along the way to sort of correct you know, this astray, you know, environment that he had gone through. What other weird misconceptions did he have about life itself? Um, the, the problem, as I see it, is we are quite estranged. And culturally, we're uh, a little bit fearful about getting back into uh, alignment at some basic level. I'm going to mention that more in a minute. But, you know, um, I was reading not long ago that the average American watches, a senior watches TV over six hours a day. And I was surfing the net this morning, seeing that the, different, the number is not that different for Canadians, except it has morphed a little bit towards looking at the net as well. A couple hours looking at the net, three to four hours a day watching TV. I mean, many of us don't realize that because that's not a world that we may or may not be a part of. But it's quite a pathology, in my opinion. There's a great book called Four Arguments Against TV. And one of the arguments that he makes is for seniors, they get these um, visions in their mind about what the world is about, and they can't get it out of their mind. So it grows a paranoia and a distrust in our fellow human being, which is the antithesis of what we need to grow a viable society. We, to, to grow a viable society, we need to be able to um, you know, commune with our neighbor, not be fearful of our neighbor, and all the rest. You know, contrast that with how easy it is to find out what our cousin is having for lunch in Paris via the text. Um, you know, and contrast that, I mean, uh, actually what I really want to contrast that with is, you know, the, the um, possibility of two or three neighbors sitting on a front porch talking about the issues of the day. Um, imagine two seniors, one in this compartment and one in that compartment, whether it's a single family house or an apartment or, or uh, uh, you know, an assisted care room or whatever, watching television versus sitting on the table, uh, at the table in a co-housing community. This happens to be where I live in Nevada City, California. And, um, and talking about the issues of the day. Sure, playing cards was the, the, uh, the uh, auspiciously, ostensibly why they got together. Mostly two of them got together to play cards. The other two stopped to laugh at how bad they were playing cards. But invariably, they would segue into the issues of the day. I stopped and had a coffee with one of my neighbors the other day. I planned to sit there in his front porch and have coffee for 15 or 20 minutes. And two hours later, I had learned so much from this other human being, so much that I meant so much to me and um, hof hopefully meant something to him. But the point is, um, we weren't estranged. We weren't separated. So I'm going to um, you know, mention some statistics that I I find a staggering. One of them I mentioned this morning, which is, you know, uh, uh, U U.S. Americans drove last year five billion miles to serve seniors, um, either Meals on Wheels or nurses on the care, or uh, um, nurses on the go. That's a lot of um, separation, and. <clears throat> 
to imagine you know, people driving five billion miles, well, not to mention what it does to the environment, not to mention how estranged people are to, for us to have let that happen. In other words, we have simply left the village. You know, there's, there's very little village-like inhabitation any longer. We're, about, we're at the end of some dirt road sometimes, whether it's the proverbial cul-de-sac or an actual dirt road. But, um, but those programs don't always last. It, wasn't, uh, it was a, a sharp and immediate cost cut in um, Kansas City a few months ago, for example, that meant that seniors were getting not 14 meals a week, but, um, but um, one meal a week. I don't know how they're surviving on that, but you know, there was an immediate necessary cost cut, and, and that happened. So we know that these devices that we've set up that theoretically make it possible for people to age in place um, are tenuous. It's a tenuous institutions that we've created that's not anywhere near the kind of strength that we have in us if we um, you know, you know, uh, you know, manage to find a way to use our interconnectedness to, um, to get by. In our county, the county I live in, Nevada County, there's 100,000 people. In western Nevada County, 50,000. The big lumbering paratransit last year made uh, 64,000 trips for seniors, mostly getting them to the pharmacy, the doctor, their friends, the grocery store. Um, usually there's one or two seniors in this 12-seater bus that's, you know, bigger than this table. And, um, and you know, that's uh, 64,000 for about 2,000 seniors. It's about 300, I mean, um, 30 trips uh, 30 trips a, um, a year per senior. And some people say, oh, that's far too many, you know, in terms of the cost and all the rest. And some people say that's far too few in terms of the connectivity. Recently, we had um, a, uh, in, our, in our little town, we had a 17-year-old kid who was passing an 80-year-old woman um, and unfortunately ran into a 76-year-old man who died in the accident. Um, we have too many seniors who are on the road themselves. I mean, if there's not somebody coming to their house for Meals on Wheels, then they're trying to <laughs> escape the isolation of the, the single family house or other. And, you know, personally, I don't know if you can hear it, but I, I kind of feel that um, it's time for us to reimagine um, where we've let this go and, and uh, uh, figure out a way that we can, you know, get away from that setting. And I'd like to personally get away from that setting that it was a lot broader than, you know, the institutions. You know, there's so many um, uh, organizations out there, for-profit and non-profit, that are for sure are trying to do everything in, in their power to, you know, help seniors get into a, a more supportive environment. Sometimes before they're ready, I just read recently that 40% of the Americans who live in assisted care don't, shouldn't live in assisted care. 40%. And it, too often it happens because somebody fell down, for example, was left there for six or eight hours. And obviously, you know, it was life-threatening if they didn't get into a highly, you know, institutionalized environment. My mother ended up in that situation. And for 15 years she lived in assisted care, and, and then a few of those years she lived in a, in a, um, a residential care. And, but in any case, within the first week of living there, um, she was almost kicked out, very, came very, very close because she had Tylenol in her room and there was a zero, zero tolerance in terms of you know, allowing for that kind of thing, that kind of independence. Um, my, my sister had left it there. And, um, and I couldn't help but imagine, here's a, a grown person, uh, you know, should be an elder in the community, if you will, um, you know, raised six kids, had her own business, very much an ultra responsible all of her life, and all of a sudden had become, you know, treated like a child again, unfortunately. And she hated it with a passion. Um, unfortunately, we, we weren't able to get a senior co housing project built before, you know, for her on time, as far as I'm concerned. Um, the, um, uh, the, the point I was going to make about um, the assisted care is that. You know, it's not for everybody, and we have to broaden our scope. And right now, uh, according to Bill Thomas, he, he, there's, we have 16,000 residential care facilities in the U.S., and it's really time to imagine that as well. In fact, he was just 
somebody just quoted him the other day as saying that as far as he's concerned, every single one of them needs to start over in terms of, of how, we, um, how we accommodate people. In fact, for those of you who weren't here, how many people were not here this morning? Um, actually, most of you, okay. Well, one of the things he says is that you can take 20 seniors, put them on a boat, and take them to a desert island, and they will do a better job of figuring out how to care for themselves than any single institution we've yet created, which is possible. I'm not sure, but after watching and, and uh, facilitating the creation of these senior co-housings, I actually believe it. I actually believe it, and, and from watching what I saw happen in, in, in a, a assisted care. You know, where my mother lived, there was 118 beds and 55 staff. That's, some, that's a lot of people dawdling over you, who, which wasn't necessary. And so we have another problem, which is an economic problem. You know, again, Bill Thomas, to quote him, he wrote a great book, if you haven't read it, it's called What Are Old People For? <laughs> anyway. And, um, and in that book, he describes that we, ha we really do, in the U.S., have a $3 trillion problem. And that is, if we try to accommodate seniors 20 years from now, anywhere near as well as we accommodate them now, it's going to cost about $3 trillion more than we currently spend. Well, our total GDP for the whole country is $13 trillion. So it's not likely that we're going to come up with an extra $3 trillion to, um, to uh, enhance all of these institutions. So from another point of view, we have to figure out a more organic means so that, for example, people are, you know, 40% of the population assisted care who don't belong there are, are elsewhere. And the other analogy that I made this morning that makes so much sense to me. I was reading the philosopher recently, Wittgenstein, and he was describing, you know, in the context of language, but, you know, very analogous to my experience with senior co-housing, he was describing, you know, the, the you know, great detail using a rope or a thread um, or a fabric or a, um, a fiber as an analogy that no single piece is is all the way, the full length of it. No fiber, no cable gets all of its strength from a single strand, but it's the intertwining of the strands that gives it so much strength. And like a language, we patch so much meaning, not with one word, but with the, this, this, the uh, stringing of all these words together. And you know, when I think about the 20 seniors who live in my co-housing community, I think about you know, Leo Portis, who at 80 years old, had a, a tumor removed from her chest recently, was in a hospital for a month and then convalescing for another two months after that, and was, of course, needing the care of all 57 other people, who, adults who lived in our co-housing community. But throughout the formation, the creation, the investing, the uh, organizing of our community, she was very much an integral part through the management of it as well. She's actually on the maintenance, the uh, physical maintenance committee, for example. We have 20 seniors. All of them are decapacitated for 20 or 30 percent of the time. But for the rest of the time, they belong to a very giving, loving setting that very much is easily, uh, easily accommodates those periods of time when they're, uh, they're not uh, you know, at their best, but they don't have to necessarily live, leave that homegrown neighborhood that they, they helped make. Um, um, let me go ahead and see if I can um, uh, crank up the slides after I just think of one or two other things here to mention, um, let's see. You know, the Vancouver Foundation recently wrote a fantastic report. If you guys haven't read it, I, I, I read it a couple times. I was so astounded, it's about 100 pages long. And they went through Van Vancouver and tried to analyze the social well-being of people who live in the condos and the, um, and the apartments in town here. And I got very involved with it when we were um, organizing the Vancouver co-housing community because we had to come up with a moral imperative for all the rules we wanted to break, basically. And, and, um, and the, um, the real moral imperative of, of which there are many, of, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is how many people, according to the Vancouver Foundation, for example, 57% of, um, of people who live in the, in the apartments and condos of, of Vancouver don't trust their neighbor, or the, when they were asked, do you trust their neighbor, only 43% uh, of the population said yes. And that number only went down to 40% uh, of mistrust when they had lived in a neighborhood for 
over 25 years. One statistic after another in terms of, I know that in planning this project, there were a number of people, this young woman who had moved into it. She had a, a, a single mom. She had a young child. She lived in a condo project, a strata project for the last six years. Didn't know one single neighbor. So, and that, and the, the Vancouver report the, um, is riddled with those kind of statistics. And as far as I'm concerned, those are the statistics that matter. I mean, of course, we all care about global warming, for example. But I think that if we're going to figure out a way to um, handle that, we're going to do it together. We're going to actually, I can't imagine any issue, whether it's education or the environment, that we're going to um, manage to um, accomplish in a better way than doing it together. You know, <clears throat> there's some, uh, we just finished a senior co-housing community in Grass Valley, California, 30 units. And I was sitting there with uh, having dinner there a few weeks ago, and one of the residents, a 77-year-old named Butch Thresh, he says, he says, Chuck, I before I moved here, I used to buy five to six tanks of gas uh, a month, and now I buy less than one. You know that that means a lot to me in terms of getting, you know, being part of the solution, letting the setting these seniors up for success not only for his own social life, that he doesn't have to drive from one end of the county to another to all the connected people that he has. I mean, we, he, of course he had a social life. He, of course he had a community. We're a social animal. But for the most part, it's based on our telephone, our automobile, and our date book. And now he lives in a, in a, in a very rem, reminiscent of a village-like setting. So he doesn't, doesn't need that anywhere as much as he used to. Um, now I want to talk about the antidote for a moment, for a few moments. You know, in 1985 uh, in Denmark, and I, I went to school for a couple of years in uh, Copenhagen and um, learned about quite a, quite a variety of innovative approaches that they were taking to housing and senior housing. But in 1985, they started a, an, or, uh, an effort called Study Group One. And Study Group One was all about getting 20 seniors in the room and talking about the issues of the day, especially in particular talking about the issues of getting older. You know, of course, my knee doesn't, is not what it used to be. Um, uh, my uh, memory is not what it used to be necessarily. Uh, my, uh, emotionally, you know, my child has left home. Uh, my neighbors have left town or, you know, died. My, who knows what's happened to my spouse. I mean, really taking stock in the changes, the real changes of life, not just living the advertisements, not just living the myth, if you will, but really trying to get grips with reality. So in other words, becoming conscious, number one. And then number two, they very much embrace the possibility of helping people getting out of denial. I mean, they're getting older. Frankly, if you're lucky, you're getting older. And embracing that reality um, and embracing that uh, fortune, frankly, you know, that the, the fortune of experience, the fortune of knowing other people who've had real experiences. And there's a richness there that if you haven't lived like, you know, like I live now with 20 seniors, it's a phenomenal richness. It's a, it's a blessing. It's like a natural resource. Um, and then the third thing that they do is they um, very much help people, if you become conscious and get out of denial, well, actually, they don't have to do much in the way of helping people. It's a natural next step is getting proactive about doing something. You know, sometimes people just put, you know, grab bars in their house. Sometimes they move back to the small town they grew up in. Sometimes they move in with a sister, move in with a daughter. Um, but they do something. About 100% of them do something. Um, about 40% of them join a co-housing effort, and that's why co-housing has really taken off in that, in that country because of this whole conscious raising um, episode that's been going on there. In other words, you know, we don't have to live the myth anymore. Um, as uh, uh, Bill Thomas likes to say, you know, we need to stop living the American dream and start living the American awakening. And, um, and that starts with consciousness and, um, and, you know, and then acting on it. So with, uh, uh -oh, what did I do with the, the re oh, here it is, the promote, the remote. Let's see if I can operate it here. Um, my grandmother in the middle there, you know, I, I, I mentioned this morning that I grew up in a small town of about 325 people, and that's one of the key places that I got very motivated, or not motivated, uh, 
aware of the difference between living in an estranged environment and, and, a, and a connected environment. Uh, my, my parents were divorced. My father lived in this small town of 325. My mother lived in the suburbs of Sacramento. And yearly, every year, I was going back and forth between these two environments. And I couldn't, of course, help mad, uh, noti- couldn't help but notice how much support and connectedness there was in this small town, how much effort went into, um, you know, basically, you know, the growth and to some extent the well-being, but definitely the obvious codependence on, on each, of the peop- each of the parties in this town. And then back in the suburbs realizing that virtually basically nobody gave a damn. One way or the other, there was pretty much you and the TV and a, and a nuclear family and a garage door. And uh, you could genie up the garage door, pop your dinner in the microwave and pop your movie in the VCR. And that's living. And that's a lifestyle. Um, it was a lifestyle that I, I, um, I, I uh, you know, saw over and over again compared to living in a small town. I mentioned this morning that you know, my grandmother was more or less dead, uh, bedridden her last 10 years. And there were about 15 people in town who took care of her and kept her in the town. That's a co-dependence, you could call it, I guess, or it's a, a community. It's a place where you know, she had a lot of cachet because she was the queen of quilting and canning and all the traditional arts, and, um, and, uh, and a lot of people knew and loved her and, and took care of her, um, and uh, contrast. You know, the the notion of the small town is not, um, again, it's not uh, anything new. We're simply, as the Danes would say, creating the kind of environment that used to happen naturally, that um, now we have to stop and say, okay, what are we doing? And do we like it? And if we don't like it, let's do something else. That seems to be the interesting change that um, we have to embrace. What are we doing? Do we like it? If we don't, let's stop and do something else. And um, maybe we didn't have to do that when it was more natural. It was, you know, you could argue it was more natural because everything was a smaller scale. Now with, you know, large corporations getting involved with development and large banking and all the rest, everything has to scale up immensely. So it's not human scale at some basic level. It's corporate scale. At an, uh, and and that, that's not only our housing, that's our neighborhoods and, and so many other environments. Um, <clears throat> The uh, thing, if you're not familiar with co-housing, the uh, thing that the four things that characterize it is one is that the future residents are an integral piece of the future planning and uh, design and organizing and development. They're virtually co-developers. They basically are sitting there making land use decisions with everybody else. You know, I've designed over 50 co-housing communities now, and people often ask me, "Hey, Chuck." you've designed all these co-housing communities, why don't you just like design it and maybe we'll like it and maybe we won't. But I know it wouldn't have happened, wouldn't have worked with the Vancouver group, but incredibly opinionated group of people. <laughs> incredibly opinionated, which by the way, was awesome, frankly. It was, uh, you know, lots of great opinions came to the table and frankly, they made a better project than I could have ever made by myself. And I feel like that every single time. Every single time I feel like, wow, these guys are bringing real experience to the table, real lives to the table, um, real values to the table, and uh, experiences, and it's going to be better than I could have ever imagined by myself. And even more importantly, they're going to own it emotionally, so they're going to fight for it. And in the beautiful downtown Vancouver, believe me, it was a little bit of a workout getting that thing approved. But, um, and I, obviously, that project would have never been possible without the future residents for so many levels, but um, politically for sure. The other three things I'll just go through briefly is that, um, um, uh, that it's designed to facilitate a sense of community. And that's, that's not, you know, you know, we don't start out every project saying we're going to make a, you know, a place that really facilitates a sense of community. That is, that's, uh, seems to be the natural migration of 20 or 30 or 40 humans in the room. We're going to make this thing human, basically. I don't know why that's such a mystery, but, um, you know, that it, uh, um, and they, they managed to accomplish it. Um, uh, this happens to be in Nevada County. This happens to be where I live. I'm in the back there making sure they don't make any mistakes. But, um, but um, and whispering sweet little nothings in their ear, a little closer, a little farther. No, actually, I wasn't in the, in very much in this case. They did, they did a great job. They actually had 11 acres to work with. 
and you know, fair amount of property. Um, and I thought, you know, this is a very rural part of California, only uh, 3,000 people in the town. And uh, you know, people were moving from 20 acres to 100 acres, very iconoclastic country folks to some extent. And I thought, oh, this is going to be interesting. We're going to end up with uh, houses all over hell and high water. But in the course of putting that project together, they started to, to um, discuss the ramifications, the various ramifications of how, having houses closer and farther and all the rest, and talking about when you had the houses closer to each other, you could actually facilitate community, and you could actually have larger backyards by having the houses closer together, so I could have more privacy by having the houses closer together, and I could have more community by having houses closer together, and that is one of the key characteristics of a co-housing site plan, is when you walk on the site, you feel like you have as much community as you want, or as much privacy as you want as opposed to so many neighborhoods where you feel like you have as much privacy as you want or as much privacy as you want and not much choice. So, um, you know, they basically built that choice into the table. Uh, third thing is, is that there are extensive common facilities. Again, we don't champion common facilities. We just say, okay, what do you guys, what's going to make your life easier, more convenient, more practical, more um, uh, economical, uh, more interesting and more fun besides your house. And it always amazes me how many common facilities these groups come up with. Um, you know, we have dinner in our common house available six nights a week. Um, you know, there's nothing that any of those people had imagined before, but it turns out if somebody else shopping, cooking, and cleaning makes life easier. Just turns out. And, um, and, um, and then the th fourth thing is that it's, it's completely um, self-managed. So here's the site plan they came up with using about three and a half acres. Um, and you know, here's the lifestyle there now. As I mentioned, um, we are um, uh, 34 houses, 57 adults, 20 seniors, and um, about 37 kids. So this is an intergenerational co-housing. And since this is a conference about seniors, of course I'm gonna dwell on the topic of, of seniors. Um, quite often, you know, the audience is very motivated to create um, family-friendly housing, um, and that's, an, you know, that's most of the 120 co-housing projects done in the U.S. are families, intergenerational, and, um, and then there's another eight now just finished on seniors only. Um, but it's interesting, even in the context of multifamily, I mean, I'm sorry, intergenerational, the uh, seniors end up having dinner a lot together, They're, they have a lot in common and discuss you know, their issues of the day. I had dinner with uh, a group of them the other day and uh, they were discussing the four knee doctors in town. <laughs> and as soon as they started talking about the four knee doctors, I thought to myself, those doctors don't have a chance. <laughs> they're gonna triangulate this story in about 10 minutes and they're gonna know exactly who the best doctor is. And they did. Boy, it was like no doubt about it. The consensus came in, this is the only one to go to, blah, blah, blah. But it's a lot more than or organ recitals, by the way. Um, they, uh, you know, they were very um, uh, proactive in the beginning about talking. This is Leo, 80 years old, that I was mentioning a minute ago. They were very proactive in the creation of this place to make sure that it was easy to you know, to be and talk with each other and make it very spontaneous, you know, everything wasn't a super conscious act. In fact, in the creation of a new site plan for co-housing, the thinking is, let's be very conscious about it now to the point of almost being silly so that later we don't have to think about it. We're consciously stitching an environment together that makes sense for us so that in the, in the future it's not about texting people and phoning people, it's about running into people, for example. So in, in our first book, we talked a lot about the, the, um, the, st the stats for you know, living in co-housing versus single-family houses. And um, one of the stats were kind of interesting, which was 80% um, uh, of the time that somebody's in their front porch or their back porch, they're in their front porch and 20% in the back porch, which is the complete inverse of typical suburban dwellings where 20% of the time you're in the front of your house and 80% you're in the back. And that's always interesting to me, what happens when you actually know your neighbors. You're not afraid of your neighbors anymore. You're not even afraid of that awkward moment when you don't know what to say to them. 
so therefore you sit in the back porch, for example. Or those awkward moments where um, uh, you, know, you realize that you've, this person's lived next to you for five years and you still don't even know their name, much less their birthday, for crying out loud. So, um, so to avoid all that awkwardness, uh, the pathology of isolation just grows and you find, you, know, you, you find that it's easier to be in your backyard. It's easier to be in front of your Facebook page and not have to face you know, uh, folks in an odd moment. Interesting thing, Leal, who you know, lived in a single family house in the middle of nowhere, <clears throat> previously spent a lot of time talking about, you know, Chuck, now we have to make sure that we strike a balance between privacy and community, and of course we did, but I've never seen her in her backyard, turns out. You know, previously, as far as anybody in the world knows, she only had a backyard previously because even her front yard was like a backyard. There was no connected to anybody anywhere. And yet, once we got together and talked about, you know, the distances between the houses over a three or four day period, um, you know, it was clear to her that it would be, my life would be better if I could say hello to these people that I knew and care about readily as opposed to um, not. Um, and you know that's that's the um, that's the uh, day and day of uh, living in a co-housing, which is it's it's easy to say howdy. Um, <clears throat> some of my staff got kind of creative on the on the on the dialogue, so I don't even know what it says, but it doesn't matter. Um, um, the uh, you know this is the epitome of spontaneity, where these three women on this Sunday evening are going off to the headed off to the parking lot to go to the movie together, and they run into Victoria, who's now texting her husband, gone to the movie. <laughs> um, we have, as I mentioned, dinner in the Common House six nights a week available. Kate and I you know, participate two or three nights a week when I'm in town. And um, you, know, you don't have to ever participate, actually. So what's interesting, you, know, you just have to cook, by the way. You do have to cook once in a month, but you don't have to come to dinner otherwise. Um, I mean, there's very few, you know, people always say that, oh, you know, there must be a lot of rules in co-housing. Well, in fact, we have like three pages of rules, which, which is very little, you know, one of them being you have to cook once a month. Um, you know, contrast that to my brother who lives in Sacramento in a condo where he, you know, his, the rule book is about an inch thick where you have to have hubcaps on your car, you can't work on your car in the parking lot, you, ha you can't have more than one cat, all this ridiculous stuff. And, um, you know, the thing that we have that's quite different than rules is we have dialogue. We have the ability to talk to our neighbor, and we do. If something comes up that's an issue, then we just talk to each other. We have just simply learned to do that. It's not, it's not um, a big deal, it, but I would argue it appears to be part of this little bit of a cultural change where you're starting to give each other permission again to say, hey, um, <clears throat> You know, uh, your kid was making too much noise last night, and now I get to be an elder again, basically, for the first time for many, for many elders in the, in, the, in, the, in the teen room, for example. Um, you know, common dining. Um, as I mentioned, obviously, there's the community side, there's the private side. This is, happens to be Meg, who moved in at about um, 86, actually. She's now 95, and um, this happens to be her backyard. But I, as I mentioned this morning, she recently moved from one of the houses that are absolutely right next to the parking lot. Her kids, she has six kids, her kids talked her into, oh, Meg, you're gonna, mom, you're going to have to live next to your car, et cetera, you know, mobility reasons. And uh, Meg, uh, about five years ago, six years ago, bought the absolutely furthest house from the parking lot, 700 feet, two, more than two football fields. And so one day I asked her, I said, Meg, why? Why did you do that? You had this cute little house right next to the parking. She says, one day I decided that my relationship with my neighbor, on my way home and on my way to my car, my relationship with my neighbor is more important than my relationship with my car. So she decided to uh, move further. Um, it's a very convivial place. Lots of music. We have a, a very active music uh, group and, and, uh, and music room. Um, everybody has their own private house. I mean, there's a lot of discussion in co-housing about all the things we have together because that's simply what makes it unique, all the things we have together. But what sometimes gets lost is that, in fact, everybody still has their own private house. Um, and as much as, um, you know, I'm an architect, so as much as I care about, you know, a very warm and cozy, and as the Danes would say, hoogly environment, 
Um, the, um, as far as I'm concerned, and, and I also think it's extremely important, uh, as far as I'm concerned, if it doesn't work in, uh, socially, why bother? I mean, really. I mean, are we just here to cut trees down and make boxes and, and, um, and sell real estate? I mean, I think that we can do so much better than that. Um, in, a, in a convivial environment where people know each other, learn to care about each other, and the, the immediate uh, and obvious extension of that is to learn to support each other. And support each other in a way that really doesn't cramp your style. That's the, another thing that I think makes co-housing so fearful of so many. You know, and I lived in a, uh, I've lived here about 10 years, and Katie and I lived in another co-housing community in the Bay Area. In, uh, uh, for 12 and a half years, and there a 77-year-old woman died of, of uh, breast cancer, unfortunately. But what was so interesting to me in the last six months of Margaret's life was, for me personally, how it was readily easy, honor, uh, it was an honor to stop by and see Meg every day, and to bring her the paper, and read her the front page of the paper, and go across the street and get her a, a, a latte, and, and tell her about my war stories at other co-housing communities, uh, you know, to getting them built and designed because she had been through that episode in that neighborhood. And it was an honor, it was, um, of course it wasn't a pleasure, but it was actually not, it, it didn't cramp my style, I mean there was, Week after week, of course, I was in a hurry, like every person with a career and, and children and all the rest. Um, and yet, her kids, who lived across town, it was actually extremely complicated for them to show up. It was, you know, they were across town, and, and you know, there's all these family dynamics that you can never predict exactly. Um, this was uh, a different setup. It was simply she was there and she needed care and it was easy for us to do and so we did it basically. We took her to get um, medicine as she needed, doctor's appointment as she needed and I don't think anybody who lived there thought twice about it and that was not something that we bargained for when we moved in. We didn't even talk about it in that case and in some cases they do. In senior co-housing that's the main distinction between senior co-housing and intergenerational co-housing is intergenerational co-housing you just you know grow into being humans more naturally. In senior co-housing, you actually make it a conscious decision that we're going to have a caregiver on site, for example, uh, you know, in case somebody um, has an, an elongated um, uh, time uh, where they need care. Um, by the way, this was my energy bill last month. This is my, I mean, last year. That's my favorite slide right there. The reason I put it out there is because I'm amazed how many seniors I work with with senior co-housing who, you know, in the, con in the conversation, in the, uh, in the dialogue of making a, a better neighborhood, so many other issues come up too, like living lighter on the planet. So many other topics percolate to the top and they see that they can actually be part of the solution now. They don't have to be a victim. They don't have to be part of the problem. And by the way, I have to be a part of the problem because it's practical. It's the only practical thing for me to do is to have my big dumb car because I might hit something and I don't want to get hurt or whatever people's rationale for um, you know, all the uh, default mechanisms that we put into place that more or less set us up for being generally part of the problem as a part of the solution. You know, I was just reading recently that in the States, the average senior gets $5,000 a year of uh, subsidy of one kind or another, not including Medicare and Social Security and such. And the average child under uh, five gets $250 of, of care. And basically, um, you know, it's really upside down. Um, and, the, and I'm as much a believer in seniors as anybody you know, but I don't feel like we, it benefits us all to make these in, uh, expensive uh, institutions when they actually don't contribute to quality of life. So we can actually make uh, quality of life better and be part of the solution at the very same time. Um, so, for example, and that's, my staff had a great time making, putting this slideshow together, I can tell. But anyway, um, uh, um, they, um, uh, you know, have one kilowatt and that's, that, you know, that's what accomplished that. Um, but I keep coming back to this, this kind of an image, basically. When it comes to co-housing, when it comes to the very timeless 
experience of co-housing or community, breaking bread together, sitting around being human. It's, it's all about how we format the world, basically. We format it so that it's easy to be a part of the decision making. We format it so that it's easy to be part of the management and we figure out how we're gonna run this ranch. We don't need somebody else to tell us how to run the ranch because, you know, frankly, and I know there's a lot of folks in the room who, you know, run various, uh, you know, assisted care and all the rest. And, um, you know, as part of our, our third part, that dialogue, I want to talk a little bit about how we actually have a, a, an increasing amount of experience designing just senior housing, but how we actually go in after the fact and tr do the best we can to set up some semblance of a community there and actually have had a lot more luck than I thought we were going to previously because, again, it always comes back to this basic notion we're just a bunch of folks basically it's no big mystery here we've actually made it a big mystery but it doesn't have to be a big mystery we just get to the basics get to the the underlying basic human experiences involved with being human and um, uh, it's easy to it grows to become readily extension of our everyday life to actually take care of each other um, this is Meg now, who's in, a, in, a, in one of these roller devices, but she, there she's rolling her 700 feet um, to, her, to her car, and one of the neighbors, whoops, one of the neighbors is taking her somewhere. Um, I mentioned the common dinners. There's nothing more timeless in, uh, uh, in, in terms of growing community like than breaking bread together. It's probably the most timeless things. And for us Western cultures who don't have a lot of ritual anymore, there's not you know, obvious things that we do um, as more uh, ancient rituals do. Um, I, I lived in East Africa for a year, and I think they had a different ritual every Friday night. It was quite you know, ritual rich. We don't have a lot of rituals in our neighborhoods. Luckily, we still have to eat which brings us together in the context of breaking bread. And I hardly can imagine any uh, timeless, um, more timeless means of, of, of uh, stitching a, a society together. And it's not food that somebody else has created, so that means, among other things, you can't complain about it. Um, you, know, we, we, you know, in fact, it's the opposite. You know, Margaret yesterday made dinner for me, and she did a bang-up job, and so tonight it's my turn to make dinner, and so I owe it to her. In fact, I feel like the Emeryville co-housing, where I lived for 12 and a half years, was more or less a glorified eating club. <laughs> Um, but um, it's, it's a central part of the picture. Whoops. Um, um, how did I get interested in this whole co-housing? Besides my small town experience, of course that was half the equation, but I didn't know how I was going to solve that in the context of my wife um, convincing us to move to downtown San Francisco after graduating college. And the social setting there was quite different than, um, uh, than the small town I, I lived in. In fact, it was probably quite reminiscent of Vancouver in that I would be walking down the street and I'd say hello to somebody and immediately they would look away. I mean, what is this stranger person saying hello to me? I mean, they would have to look at their shoes immediately all of a sudden. And, um, and, um, um, and I kept hearkening back when I was at the University of Copenhagen the first year. Um, I had a 20-minute walk to the train station every day. And on that walk, I walked by single-family house neighborhoods, no people between the buildings. I walked be uh, next to apartment buildings, no life between the buildings, next to strata, no life between the buildings. I happened to walk by an assisted care uh, multifamily housing. I virtually never saw any life between the buildings except a rare car coming and going. And yet there was this one place that I walked by every day and there was always life between the buildings. And um, people were talking with each other, having a cup of tea together, picking apples from the apple tree together or whatever, sitting at the picnic table. Until finally one day I stopped and I said, you know, what's going on here exactly? I was quite curious in my uh, broken Danish. And uh, she replied in her perfect English that, um, you know, this was, she and her husband had grown up in, in, a, in a town that had a very high functioning neighborhood. They thought it was extremely important for their children to live in a, an important functioning neighborhood. And they weren't going to take any chances. They were going to create it themselves. It was going to be a very conscious act. It was not going to be happenstance. They weren't going to wait around for five years and figure out if they knew and liked any of their neighbors. They were going to create it with people. 
um, who would either come and go, but basically would be a, a group who decided that they could work and you know ultimately live together, and did so. Um, and so, so often again, people often say think that this is such a nouveau deal. You know, the whole co-housing must be a bunch of progressive types that are doing this. In fact, they're very conservative. We couldn't imagine more conservative people than people that think, you know what, neighborhood's important. I'm going to live it, period. I mean, you know, neighborhood is about as, um, you know, uh, you know uh, conservative a notion as you can get. And, um, and I want to live in a high-functioning neighborhood instead of, instead of not. So... This is, this is a 20-unit senior co-housing project that was finished in, in Denmark about uh, the year 2000. Interesting thing about this project is that um, I, like everybody else I know who's ever visited, Monksago is the name of it, they, you know, it's 20 units, 10 of them are upstairs, and 10 of them are downstairs. And it was explicitly designed for seniors. So I, like everybody else, said, what are you doing here exactly? You know, what do you mean, seniors? You've got all these stairs everywhere. And they, you know, they, of course, they made light of it at first. You know, it keeps us young, et cetera. Um, but then, you know, at 10 o'clock, uh, over a glass of wine, when most of our best research was done, they get, the, get to the essence. And the essence was that they had messed around for a couple of years, not being able to afford it, not being able to afford it, not being able to afford it, until finally they got together with their architect and, and uh, contractor. And they said, look, you're going to have to make 20 units exactly the same, 10 of them downstairs, 10 of them upstairs, and, um, and that's the deal. And you can afford that. And you know what? That worked out fine because of something you know, unique and, and powerful that they had together that they had already figured out by that time and that they had the magic you know, weapon, which is cooperation. In other words, if you live upstairs here and you, your knee goes out or your hip goes out or whatever reason, you need to now live downstairs or you need to live on a, on a flat level, somebody in the community will trade houses with you or you can move into the common house for some five, six weeks of convalescence as, uh, convalescing as required. But um, cooperation is really this huge watershed that trumps even environmental design. And I say that, again, as an architect. You know, and I hear from so many you know, senior experts like, oh, my God, this is just wrong. Well, this is what they cared about. They cared about this, this life right here. And they were estranged previously. That is what I think is wrong. Basically, if you really want to tap into what is wrong, if you really want to address what's wrong, you have to um, uh, be willing to consider the difference, again, of putting 20 seniors on a boat and taking them to a desert island and letting them figure it out versus telling them what they should do. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's, it's a, a binary question in a way, but in another way, it's just about... Um, Letting cooperation being what it can. Now, I was just back there. I, I visit them often, and they've never had anybody switch houses. So it's allowed them to live in co-housing for going on 15 years now. It's allowed for them to have this for 15 years. By the way, Kai, in uh, 2000, he was a you know, very virile young man at the age of 60. Now at 74, he has a very, very bad case of dementia. He comes to common dinner. They have two people with dementia, one person with Alzheimer's. It's fine, actually. They live there. Everybody supports and cares for them. It's absolutely fine. In any other setting, they would be in an institution. They would be in some kind of memory care or similar. And a whole bunch of people and a whole bunch of resources would have to go into taking care of them and looking after them. And it turns out these residents can actually do a fine job. In fact, it's an asset to their community, they would argue, that we have real humanity and faltering humanity living amongst us. And it's okay. Um, you know, uh, get-togethers in the common house. There's, there's Kai now, by the way, with severe case of dementia. And, you know, he comes to common dinner with everybody else. He doesn't say much, um, but he's part of humanity, if you will. Um, and I don't, again, I really don't want to um, take anything away from the, the folks, the good folks who are trying to do everything in an institutional setting. I just personally think it's time to reimagine um, a less than um, institutional setting because it can actually be more of an experience for at least some segments, some people in, in the population. Here, here's Kai, um, you know, uh, 14 years ago. 
And by the way, he was a, a, you know, a big proponent uh, at the time of the creation of this community of making it uh, a setup so that it's easy for neighbors to run into each other. In other words, and you know, he had no idea, of course, that he was going to get dementia someday. So interestingly enough, actually 16, 17 years ago when he was co-creating this environment, he was articulated the point that let's make it easy to support each other. He had no idea he would be the one getting dementia. I mean, and that's the reality of it, actually. We have no idea what our futures are, actually. We could get hit by a car, for example. So set it up so that it's not some huge burden, not only on everybody else, but on yourself. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the seniors, it's funny, this senior co-housing is right next to a intergenerational co-housing and the intergenerational co-housing, you know, the gardens are fallow because everybody's chasing careers and kids and spouses and all the rest. And the senior co-housing, it's amazing the projects that they do together. They're just, you know, their farm is in pristine shape. You know, they built this, uh, they built this um, greenhouse together and, um, and um, uh, you know, they, I've decided that 50 adults with time can do infinitely more than five, I'm sorry, five adults with time can do infinitely more than 50 adults with no time, basically. Um, the other interesting thing about it is, you know, of course they, they built it themselves and that's great, but, um, and of course they grow the tomatoes in there and I, I guess, I think everybody knows that after 65, growing tomatoes is a serious competitive sport. <laughs> and, um, but what really astounded me is that um, what really astounded me is to how much time they would talk about the bloody tomatoes. <laughs> I mean, the, ped the pedigree of the tomatoes. I'm just sitting there going, can, can we eat the tomatoes now, really? Um, and of course, they built it themselves, but they really built it so that they could sit around talking about building it. I mean, that's the, that's the reality. Um, um, you know, uh, the first book I wrote about co-housing in 1980... Uh, it came out in 1988. Um, you know, 13 months of studying intergenerational co-housing, um, very family-oriented. Um, nobody ever shed a tear in the course of the project, but in the first three days of, of, crea of writing the book about senior co-housing, two people broke out in, you know, wailing tears. And it was always in the contrast of talking about not only about the um, their life before they lived in co-housing and their life after moving into co-housing, but also as they expressed, you know, the, the fears about what had happened to their brothers or their mothers or other people, not fears, but the realities of what happened to them and how much they had wished it, it, they had had these kinds of options and their own fears about what might happen to them if they didn't live in a, in a supportive environment. Um, you know, I have to say, every time I visited a senior co-housing community, I'd walk around the corner and I'd see this kind of a setting and I'd feel like, you know, I'm like back, this is like back in the college dorms. I mean, this is, these guys have no jobs, no responsibilities, no kids, and they're just going to have a good time. And of course, I was showing this slide recently and somebody says, well, yeah, Chuck, just do the math. There's nine people and 11 bottles of wine. <laughs> You know, the math is not that complicated. Um, um, and, you know, that's kind of what they set out to do, of course. And then, of course, on occasion, you know, real life uh, episodes, precipitating events intervene, and, um, and somebody's not feeling well, and, and we have to take care of them. But this is the reality. My wife gives me so much critique because she thinks I dwell on, you know, in the context of senior co-housing is like, oh my God, you got to do this, otherwise you're going to end up, you know, lonely and by yourself in an institution. Well, the reality, most people who get involved do it for this reason, frankly, because they want to have a good time. And, um, and uh, so I should, I should point that out. Interestingly enough, that slide was about 10 years ago, and that one was 10 weeks ago in an American co-housing community in, in Grass Valley, California. So I, I find it, you know, again, this look is simply timeless, basically. You, this could be 5,000 years ago for, for, you know, for, for, all that, for all that matters. People getting around, uh, getting, getting about, talking about the issues of the day, you know, making life as much fun, as, as much practice as practical as possible. Um, I don't know, I'm going to zip through a few of these other slides so I can get to the third part of our party here, but uh, this, is a, this is a senior co-housing. We just finished that particular project there. Um, I mentioned this morning that I love working with seniors on senior co-housing because they're so impatient. 
Um, uh, this woman recently, whoops, this, we, this woman right here recently said, you know, Chuck, let's get this thing done. I don't even buy green bananas anymore, so. Um, and they, they are seriously, I mean, I've decided that everybody's got a little architect in them, and I, I really mean it. I mean, you get, you, get, uh, you get the thoughts flying, and they really get after it. I mean, these are just folks, but I really do believe that everybody's got a little bit of architect in them. I mean, look at these guys designing their houses right now. No, move the toilet over here, Chuck. I'm going, I've done 50 of these. Do I really have to move the toilet? And I'm amazed how many times they're right. It pisses me off, actually. Um, this is their place. It's very much an arcology. And another interesting thing about this is, again, this is a bunch of country folks in this particular case. And this was where the, uh, the guy told me that he went from driving, uh, buying six, five to six tanks a month to one. And a woman, 90-year-old woman next to, sitting next to him says, yeah, and Chuck, I just got rid of my car altogether. Um, you know, they live in this place now. And they have dinner five nights a week in the common house. She's the 90-year-old who just got rid of her car. She should have gotten rid of it a long time ago, but she needed it. <laughs> um, you know, this particular neighborhood, uh, 30, uh, 30 houses in Katati, California, with a little mixed use, it's actually a very child-oriented environment. Um, but it was started by an 86-year-old guy who wanted to live with his extended family. So, um, you know, I never want to discount the advantage for some seniors to live in intergenerational, some seniors to live in senior only. I, I don't make any distinction about which one is right or wrong. There is neither one of them is right or wrong. It's very much a function of each and ind every individual senior. I really figured that out one day when I was sitting by the pool at our common house and five or six 10-year-olds started to get really rambunctious. And you saw two or three seniors start to you know, meander over there to see what all the action was. And you saw f three or four seniors get the heck out of there as fast as they could. <laughs> I mean, there's just different sensibilities around that issue. And, um, and it just makes sense. Um, you know, interesting thing about this slide, I mean, this particular community, I'm just going to see if I have, it's very, you know, they set it up from the beginning to make sure that it's kid-friendly, I'm sorry, adult-friendly, and to do that, you have to make it kid-friendly. That's, that's key, key part of their, um, uh, of their uh, design uh, concepts. But other interesting thing about this project is that in 2004, it won the best neighborhood in the U.S., less than 151 units. And, um, and yet that's no mystery to me when you put real people together and you make a real neighborhood themselves that they would come up with the best neighborhood in, in the U.S. In, in that particular year. Um, and yet it's also surprising to me that you have developers who've been making you know, developments for projects, if you will, for 30 or 40 years and they haven't, they, you know, in a way they can't really figure it out compared to taking these folks and go, what makes sense to you? Well, what makes sense to me, and I hear it over and over again, that it's simply easy for me to walk next door and borrow a cup of sugar. Is that really nuclear science, really? I mean, it's not, it shouldn't be that complicated. It's not that complicated, but um, we sort of have not made it easy, not just because of the proximity. It's not just about proximity, though that's important, but it's, you know, these guys are a neighborhood long before they move in. They're a, move, they're a community before they move in because they co-created it. So all, everything after that is gravy, frankly. It's, it's comfortable. It's easy. I'm just going to whip through these last ones. You know, this happens to be Stillwater, Oklahoma. But, and, you know, I was just flying over, uh, uh, you know, the U.S. recently. I took a photo of this. And nobody has ever asked me in the context of making these custom neighborhoods, nobody's ever asked me, hey, just do it like, you know, this. Just do one, you know, these regular subdivisions. Nobody's ever said anything like, do it that way. You know, like I mentioned, they all have a little architect in them. We make it a very conscious act of getting together and creating criteria long before we do that so that this, this criteria over several days is reflected in what they've created. In fact, we actually do it where one group is making the blocks in this room and another group is making the blocks in a whole other room because they're both doing it based on the criteria that they had generated over a couple of days. But again, as I mentioned, how much pride they take in the place that they've created together. And then they come to a consensus on one site design. The people here from Vancouver will remember that fun ex exercise here in town. And it was a hoot. Um, and here's the site plan they came up with. Talk about chutzpah. And you know, some t oftentimes people say, 
oh, you know, it's too affordable. You know, it's not affordable doing co-housing and, you know, it costs too much money, etc. These guys, first of all, there's lots of people in this group who do not have a pot to piss and they, they had to have houses for 150000 This person right, uh, where's Marilyn, right here, she's the quintessential church lady. She makes about $25,000 a year. She works for a church. She's an administrator for the church. She had to have a house for 150000 and as far as I'm concerned, the way that she'd, she was st 65, still a renter, and to make matters worse, it was the perfect storm. She, Stillwater, Oklahoma is a college town. She rented, a, you know, one of these dumb apartments in, you know, the shoebox kind, you know, where there's one, you know, single loaded balcony and in an, a, uh, in a, in an apartment building for students. So you can imagine all these 20-year-olds really hooping and hollering on a Friday night, and here's this a uh, 65 year old church lady who was absolutely miserable frankly and of course <clears throat> in the context of um of creating this community you know everybody we had to do six houses of at 150,000 because that was the people who came to the table and um <clears throat> And this whole group of people got seriously motivated. We're going to figure out how to get this done. That's what it takes to make affordable co-housing. I've seen it over and over again. Berkeley co-housing, four single mothers got together and decided that they needed to live in a more supportive environment and made an affordable place for them to do. It was a lot more of a challenge in Vancouver, frankly. I know that, partially, largely because of the, the uh, property costs. But anyway, they did it there. But <clears throat> they also did it because they had an immense amount of chutzpah. I mean, they didn't bring a lot of, of money to the table, but they brought a lot of chutzpah. Imagine a situation where the, you go into the you know, most affluent neighborhood in town, all single family houses on four or five acres, whoops, like this um, house right here on this, on this community that we turned into a common house. Buying a single family house that's zoned for single family houses, nobody in the neighborhood imagined that'd be anything but single family houses, and asked the city if they could turn it to 24 houses. I mean, that doesn't happen. That does not happen in the regular development world. That only happens when a group of people came to the table and said, why not? Let's do it. You know this doesn't make sense. You know, they, there's that whole conversation today about talking um, truth to power. Well, you sit there at the city council and you talk, you know, these good folks say, why not? Why can't we do this? This makes too much sense to leave this house here with all this acreage. A 95-year-old guy had recently just died in this house. He had lived in all this isolation for a very long time. And, um, and they won 4-0 at the Planning Commission and won 5-0 at the City Council. In other words, you bring people to the table and the whole question of why not resonates in a whole new way, frankly. You get a developer with his white shoes and white belt um, there talking to, the developer, uh, talking to the Planning Commission. You know, they don't have the sway. They don't have, they don't have the moral turpitude that's going to change the conversation in a meaningful way that a group of folks like, you know, like these guys do. Let's see if I can whip through some of them. Now they're, they're moved in. They're, they're happy there. Um, a lot of prioritizing goes along the way. That's what we're doing right here. I'm presenting the design and we're prioritizing stuff. There's, this is them living there. This is them living there. Living. Living. Um, I, don't, I don't think I have many more, but I'll, I have a few more. Um, this is a project we finished not long ago in, in um, Boulder, Colorado. And um, I just want to, the key thing about this 16 unit project was that how much time the residents wanted to spend manicuring the life between the buildings. And I was, it was really the most interesting thing about work on this project. It's like taking the single family, I mean, the, the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the street between your single family houses and deciding you're gonna take all the cars off the street and now you're gonna put a common garden there, a common workshop area, uh, an amphitheater, a stage, common dining, common cooking, front porches, in other words, you're going to re-inhabit the world between the buildings. And we're going to inhabit it in a, in a more village-like setting than an auto-oriented setting and park all the cars uh, at the periphery, which is for sure a, a, a telltale sign of co-housing. And now they live between the buildings very much. It's a senior co-housing. Um, and in planning that project, they were very conscious about Chuck, you know, make sure that as many houses as possible can see the bicycle shed because it, they, have, they go bicycling every 10 a.m., every morning at 10 a.m., 
And, um, and they were very conscious. Again, it's like being so conscious as to be silly. I want to see if Margaret's going for a bike ride because I haven't seen her forever, or Judy, or whatever. Or if Judy can do it, I can do it. Or I, you know, Jim's going for a bike ride. So every day there's literally three to seven people who show up at 10 a.m. And, and go for a bike ride. You know, um, what age? Um, uh, oh, I forget her name exactly, but um, C- Camelia or something. She was getting involved with this project. She's, she was 51 years old, not, not very much money. She was a, a bag groceries at the grocery store. And she was getting involved with this project. She, her 80-year-old mother was uh, in the group. The 80-year-old mother decided not to move in, but she moved in. <laughs> a lot of prioritizing, as I mentioned. Um, she was 83 when she moved in. She, her husband had died 10 years previously, and she said, I was losing my words. I was forgetting words and therefore concepts, and I wanted to live around people. Whoops! I wanted to live around people that I could talk to and and um, uh, stay communicative with. You know, for those of you back to this uh, mo- a moment, this whole thing about living lighter on the planet. Bill McKibben, you know, the guy in the U.S. who's trying to the be- you know, the most effective guy trying to stem the tide of, of global warming. He he wrote in our introduction to our book. He says, you know, the thing that astounds me most about um, visiting co-housing communities, not all the energy they save, but all the energy they create. There's so much energy you feel when you walk on site, not only f- for interpersonal gain, but you know, how to uh, uh, you know, address this whole life deal, this life, uh, the whole life deal. Um, Bellingham co-housing, not far from here, you know, this is kind of quintessential co-housing design. They were very clear from the beginning you know, Chuck, we're really into dancing, 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 dancing. You know, and I thought, oh, that's cool. And, you know, I, I hope it's true because I'm going to, you know, make the lights so that you can move them up and spring the floor and all the rest. May 13, 2000 was their very first common dinner. Right after dinner, they moved the tables out of the way and set up some instruments and started dancing. So I thought, oh, that's cool. That's nice. Um, we'll see what happens. And the next day, you know, whoops, it turned out to be, well, actually, I have another slide of the next day. They're also doing the same thing. So they were very clear about it. Um, You could argue, a lot of people argue that co-housing is just custom-made neighborhoods to address that that kind of stuff. 10 o'clock, coffee every day. If you ever get a chance to visit Bellingham co-housing, it's a stellar place. It it really is. I'm going to whip through these last ones. Victor... uh, Langley, in uh, just a few miles from here, Winsong Co-Housing. So it's also a stellar place. It really is. If you ever get a chance to visit that place, it's super. You know, this whole community thing, it's kind of nebulous. Um, It's hard to get your arms around. It's complicated to quantify. Um, Because Christian here was a quadriplegic, he was a party to a 100-kid study nationwide in the U.S., and um, in that study, they, they looked at a lot of factors in his life, and one of the factors was how, many, how much time did he spend with people that were paid to be with him versus people that were not paid to be with him. Out of 100 kids, there were only two that had more interaction with people who were not paid to be with him, physical therapist, barber, doctor, teacher, and all the rest. Only two out of 100 spent more, 98 spent more time with people that were actually paid to be with him than, than not. When you walk onto um, Muir Commons co-housing, you didn't need to read the study. Previous to moving into co-housing, he had about three hours of peer, peer interaction. A week after moving in, he had about 23 hours of peer interaction a week, or in other words, as much as he wanted to. And, but you didn't need to read the study to realize that you know, when, if there was a, the kids were playing tag or football or whatever they were doing, peer, I mean, uh, Christian was simply... Involved, he was in, in, included. It was that's a natural piece of being, uh, it being readily doable. Versus previously, when it was a real workout for his mother to get the electric wheelchair in the car and have a play date, and he'd basically go to somebody's house and do some Nintendo and uh, for a couple of hours and then come home. It's a, it was quite a different experience that his mother actually, you know, describes in great detail and quite and, and very elegant about it. Um, Interesting thing about this shot, this happens to be Emeryville co-housing. And um, it's a good segue into our, our next conversation about, you know, what do we do around cultural change? Because not one single person that you see in that slide was actually born in the U.S. 
this is Emeryville, California, in the San Francisco Bay Area, none of them, but they had all lived in an environment before, whether it was South Korea or Belgium or China, where a sense of community was just more uh, a part of the, the villages and towns that they had grown up in, and they wanted to see that re-involved. In fact, actually, we worked on a project in Japan a few years ago, Tokyo, 25 million people in Tokyo, 22 of the uh, 25 people involved with that project grew up in Muras. Uh, Mura is a small town. If you've ever flown over Japan, you see all these small towns, 100 to 200 people, very agricultural. And 22 of the 25 people had known what it's like to live in a place where people knew you, people cared about you, people thought about you, people asked your opinion, um, um, uh, people wanted your help, people wanted to help you, you know, basic human stuff. And, um, and so part of the challenge I find in the U.S., and I don't know about Canada, but probably similar, is where when that has been weaned from our existence, how do we um, reintroduce it, especially in the context of seniors, um, because it's such a low-hanging fruit. It's, such, it's the way that we're going to solve our mutual issues around this concern. There's too much humanity left on the table if people are you know, watching TV versus helping each other solve the issues. So I think that's it. Thank you guys. So we have 12 or 14 minutes. Yeah, so I'd like to take some questions, but in particular I want to address this issue is how do we, you know, um, talk to our culture in a way that says, hey, we can do this if we, if we want to, and maybe, if, and maybe that's the question, do we want to? So anyway, I'll take questions. Ma'am. Uh, what about if people have addictions to smoking? <laughs> what if, how, how do the others react? Yeah, how do, they, how do you deal with it? people don't want to quit smoking here. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, Leal actually smoked in it. I don't think they would say that. They, uh, they have done it to me. Oh, they have? Yes. Oh. Hmm. So this is a personal question. And it's a relevant question. I mean, it's super relevant. Yeah, right. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The question is, what if somebody smokes in your co-housing? And, you know, and it's not just what if they smoke. You know, it's almost always somebody asks me, what if you get some you know, difficult person living in your co-housing? And it actually gets worse than that. What happens if you move in and you find out, well, you're the difficult person? What is the answer? Well, yeah, okay. What is the answer? She wants an answer. Um, um, well, you know, uh, Leal, the person I, you know, I've spent chatting about a few times, I showed a photo of there. She smoked when we moved in. And at first it was kind of interesting because, you know, you had, you know, there are a few bleeding liberals in that group and they're all just sure that it was, you know, that he was going to kill everybody else if they smoked and, you know, if she smoked and all the rest. But, and, you know, at first it, they thought it was going to be an issue Something happens when you start to know about, you know, know somebody else. You really care about them. It's like, what if your mother smokes? You don't get to tell her to stop smoking, right? You get to hint that she might stop smoking and all the rest. But, you know, there, we have foibles. And, um, you know, there was a, there was a, I was talking to somebody who lived in a, a, a co-housing community the other day, and they had somebody in that community that's certifiable nut, as far as I'm concerned, as far as they're all concerned, certifiable. And... Um, and I was asking George, so how's that working out? And, and, and George says, you know what? It's funny. You don't really have a village if you don't have a village idiot. <laughs> so, um, and so maybe, you know, maybe, you know, we have to figure out how to, we, we don't have to embrace the foibles of our species, but we better learn to tolerate them a little bit better. Is that so? I really believe so. I really believe so. I mean... We really do need to, that's my opinion. I'm sticking to it. Ma'am. Can you envision if this kind of cohabitation, oops, 
uh, co-housing yeah. could work in a rental environment as opposed to um, ownership. Yes, um, yeah, and you know, we have, we've had five to nine renters in our co-housing. It's been fine, actually. Uh, most of them have a percentage of, co- of renters in them. Um, you know, people, we've had actually four deaths in our co-housing community. A lot of people moved in rather late in life. And, um, and so that's been, you know, the heirs have rented it and all the rest. There are projects in Europe that are all rentals. Um, I expect that to happen more in the U.S. It's a little bit more complicated in the U.S. because, um, you know, it, it's hard to uh, uh, um, discriminate in a funny way around, you know, you have to be a co-houser to live in this rental, subsidized rental house. So, but it is happening more and more in different, different ways. And I mentioned earlier that, you know, we do a fair amount of affordable housing as well, you know, highly subsidized housing. And there's more and more of those that are, you know, hire us just because they want as much community setting as possible, basically. It might not be co-housing, but Chuck, do what you can to make this thing work socially. And by the way, it's so fun, be, interesting, because as an architect, I watch myself. Look, I'm not interested in warehousing all these people. I want to get in after the fact and set this up to feel like a community. So we try to do the same with um, in, in rental housing as well. Um, the time hasn't happened in the U.S. or Canada yet where it's an all-rental, high-functioning co-housing yet. I expect the next five to ten years they'll be just as, uh, just as common as they are in Europe. How do, you, how do you gain all the interaction that you had presupposed with acquirers when it's a rental? Well, you just, you, you, you bet, just, like the rent, just like the ownership, they have to be involved in the design, actually. And that's no big deal. Why not? You know, I mean, again, people are simply bringing real lives, real experience, real values to the table and co-developing it. They have young children that they want to protect, you know, mobility issues that they want to address, you name it. They all have the exact same issues as the owners. And, sir? How, how do you get one of these things started? How do the people come together and then come to you? What's the process? Or what's the process? Like, what's the thinking process? Yeah. Well, the thinking, by the way, start off by buying this book right away. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, uh, 100,000 words on how to start your little co-housing community. And um, it's published here in British Columbia. So um, I have a few problems with the publisher, but it's nothing against British Columbia, of course. Uh, <laughs> sir? Yeah. Could you ask people to use the mics? Okay. Okay, sorry. Yes, and so I'll do that next. And thank you. He made the point that um, recognize the people at the mics and recognize the people in the back and repeat the question. So the question was, again, how does this whole oh, how does it get started? Thank you, sir, for coming up and mentioning that. Um, how do they get started? Um, variety of ways. You know, in Vancouver, for example, our book came out in 1988. The first time I spoke at Simon Fraser was actually 1989. And um, it was a great audience, and you know, we, it was almost you know, more or less an academic exercise. It was extremely complicated to get a project. I think in the last, uh, that was 89, so in the last, uh, how many years is that now? 25 years, really? Oh my God. Anyway, <laughs> um, there have been uh, probably two dozen projects come and go. Finally, a friend of mine actually came to Vancouver and um, talked to another guy in the back here Alan Forrester into um, selling his site to a co-housing group and you know they were off so in high real estate um, uh, areas like Vancouver it actually takes usually somebody else to help a professional get involved with getting uh, securing the land however quite often you know I was just in Virginia um, you know land is cheaper a couple families get together Bellingham uh, Washington four families got together and um, bought a piece of property together and then organized a 33-unit co-housing. Usually, you know, frankly, um, they get somebody involved who's done it before. Um, it drives me a little bit crazy. You know, I've never done this before, but I know exactly what I'm doing. You know, you hear that all the time. I mean, it, you know, Katie and I in our various books, this is the seventh book we've written about co-housing now. Um, <clears throat> you know, we made it sound very grassroots because we really care a great deal about the grassroots aspect of it. But it really pays to have some real professionals involved. It ends up saving you a lot of money and not, and not costing you more. But anyway, and, and I really would suggest 
There's um, you know good books on the topic on how to get a project started, and there's one called, in fact, we just finished recently called "Growing a Community," and it's about how to get the word out, you know, um, how to secure a site and all the rest. Um, I'm looking forward to in the future when people who, for example, um, organize assisted care or other arrangements actually say, hey, we've got these two acres over here. We have a little you know, residential care, assisted care, and independent care, whatever, and we'd like to have a little co-housing over here too. I'm really looking forward to when the institutions get involved. In Denmark, the planning departments are actually much more proactive about um, offering sites up to co-housing groups. That hasn't happened in no North America yet. I, to date, I feel like planning departments do everything they can to stop co-housing projects. It drives me crazy. But um, anyway, the future will be easier, I hope. Sir. I have a, you mentioned as some kind of a sidebar that in your own co-housing you have professional help coming in for some of, of the, the people living there. Is that organized by the, the entity or is it sort of hodgepodge that people uh, get help when they, when they need more than what the community can provide? Are you Danish? Yes. You sound... Do, do, well, do, Chuck, I met you in the 80s in Schulslot. Oh, is it right? God. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, the, sorry about that. I didn't recognize you. Um, um, I, I didn't mean to insinuate that where I live, um, even though we have had a little bit, but... Um, of the eight units that we've finished in the U.S. for senior co-housing, um, all of them have some sort of a, um, a caretaker unit on site, a whole apartment that is just set up for the inevitability of, uh, you know, maybe taking care of Mrs. Johnson for eight hours a week and Mr. Smith for 10 hours a week, but making that easy and possible. And that is completely, I mean, it's really interesting to me. When a bunch of seniors get together and they talk about the issues of the day and they talk about that precipitating event, I was walking along and I slipped on a step and I broke my ankle and now I'm isolated for eight weeks. Let's make sure that that is not a miserable eight weeks. That only happens when people sit down together and start talking about this reality or this inev inevitability. And I don't mean to sound doomsday about it, but if you look at the stats, the stats, that happens a lot. You know, people just have little events that make it uh, make it necessary to have a you know make make it necessary to have somebody around to take care of you. We don't all have dawdling wives and dawdling you know sisters who may be in town or similar. Um, or so, what is our alternative? Off to an institution where we don't really need all that institutionalized care. It's like going to the grocery store in a in a jet airplane instead of you know a bicycle. We don't need all that institution behind us all the time. So, setting it up to be easier than that. Yeah. So that's what I meant to say, ma'am. Hi. Uh, I have to say thanks a lot. This has been really inspiring so far. Um, I'm wondering if you are aware of any co-housing models that focus on people with disabilities in particular? Well, the very first co-housing community with all with folks having disabilities was just finished in Iceland just a, a few years ago. It's a very, you can Google it, it's quite an inspiring scene there. Um, numerous ones have gotten started in the US and have not come to fruition. We did a project in Los Angeles um, 20 houses worth people with IQs of 50 to 70 and right next door IQs of 70 to 90. Kind of an interesting experience um, creating that project. They had all kinds of, of in that case, mental disabilities. Um, um, and uh, the parents, of course, we planned the project mostly with the parents. Um, and, um, and unfortunately, neither of them got funded. Uh, very amazing to me that the parents wanted these guys to be able to be completely independent. None of them were previously independent. None of them, zero. They all lived with their parents at 35 years old, for example, they live with their parents. But it turns out you organize it just right and it's easy for somebody who can figure out the bus system and they do the bus and, easy, and somebody else figures out how to buy groceries and somebody else figures out how to cook. You can actually set it, all these people up to make that possible. Bellingham co-housing, there's one young lady who moved in there who's 
developmentally disabled. And, um, and she ended up making a shared house of five de developmentally disabled, one shared house in the context of a 33 house co-housing. Again, in the context of a village like setting, you can amortize all that. You know, it's actually, again, it's great for all the kids that live there to understand that, you know, um, you know we're humans and all this unfortunate um, experiences happen to lots of humans and we need to be a part of it. We can't run from it, we can't box it off and set it aside. We need to figure out how to you know, work with it in our, own, in our own environment. Yeah. So I think it's, again, in the future, I hope. Basically, a lot of this, I kind of feel like, have to invariably be taken care of in the future. If we really have like a $3 trillion, you know, along with the silver tsunami that you hear so much about, there's a green tsunami too, which is, you know, do we have enough capital to grapple with all these issues? And, and then there's the carbon dioxide tsunami as well, which there's no friggin' way we can accommodate, um, you know, all of this uh, petrochemical being consumed to, um, you know, per capita seniors use a lot of petrochemicals, whether we like it or not, because these institutions, you know, are not efficient and all the rest. And I never get involved uh, with a co-housing community where they don't want close to zero, you know, uh, you know emission houses. I mean, that comes from consciousness. It doesn't come from, you know, letting happen what will happen. Ma'am. Yeah, just a, a quick question to refer back to the uh, co-housing for the disabled, for mentally mm -hmm. disabled, and that you mentioned in Iceland. Does that have a, a name or a location? Yeah, and so I can't remember can? it now, but if you YouTube it, you know, they're, you know disabled co-housing mm -hmm. in Iceland, you know, you'll find it. Okie doke. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Sir. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the Vancouver co-housing. We have a number of people here from the co-housing community. Would you guys like to raise your hands so they can see the future residents? The, these people who took land development into their own hands, risked their own capital, and you know, very much took a risk and very much said, you know, we're not going to, we're tired of Brand X. We're not going to do Brand X anymore. Um, it's 31 houses, so it's not that small. It was no small trick to find three contiguous sites to coagulate. Um, a, a guy here in town, uh, did Alan Forster leave? Or is he still here? Uh, there's a guy in town who, who um, coagulated three sites next to each other. That's quite a, um, quite a feat by itself. But anyway, it's 31 houses. Yes, there's a lot of theory about the size. Um, and it's not theory, it's practice. You know, the, the Danes figured out early on, don't make a co-housing community with more than 50 adults. You know, just consensus. It's mostly operated by consensus, which, you know, I wouldn't normally believe in until I got involved with it, and then I found out it's the only way to do it. Um, and, um, 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 but don't, don't do it any more than 50 adults, but also keep the number as high as possible because end of the day, it all comes down to probability and the probability of finding a dozen people that you really resonate with, you really care about. You know, the other ones cook dinner, that's what I care about, but there's a dozen that I really, you know, go find out on a Friday night when I've just had the week from hell, I go have a beer with them and, um, and, I, and the rest of them just make dinner for the rest of us and that's okay, everybody has their little, their little you know, people that they resonate with and that's okay. But just like in any village, frankly. But um, uh, so try to keep the number up because of the probability thing. In, Nevada, in Emeryville, there were only 12, 12 households. There was one gentleman who I felt like was sort of never found his, you know, his his place in the community, and that was unfortunate. Just I think it was a function of numbers. Sir. Yeah. Thank you. I want to ask two questions. One is. What, your staff, do you give them any sensitive, gen senior sensitive education like we do with gender sensitive or cultural sensitive education? Because the staff are often 40 years younger than the seniors. And my second question is, uh, is there any, do you have any programs for training for seniors where they can get workshops on being happy after 50 or 60 <laughs> or 80. Because often some seniors feel they are 
in the last year the period of journey and they and they're often feeling rejected so is there any form of anti ageism education well okay i want to answer that second one first um you know this whole thing about happy if you haven't seen the movie happy by the way it's a hoot if if you get a chance and one of the things they talk a great deal about is historically what makes people the happiest what what releases the most endorphins is connectedness um and you know there's there's nothing you can't read that relates that brings connectedness to the to that to the forefront around not only happiness but also longevity you know um the the island of sardinia many of you guys already know these stats but they have 17 times more uh centurions people living over 100 per capita than we do in the US and they always relate it back to ha- um to staying connected over and over again you know stay active mostly low impact eat healthy mostly light stay connected those are the three top when it comes to to um longevity and to happiness so um the first one is do i give my staff i you know it's so funny i kind of wish i had somebody from my staff here to uh to uh, answer that Um you know the people who come to work for our office are highly motivated you know they they believe i think like i do that you know we can do some they're just not interested in warehousing people basically they're highly motivated to make a place that is you know so, somewhat socially redeeming um if, even if it's not only uh, you know stand alone um and yet they also believe that it has more reaching ramifications but um you know it's it's a good question i mean um it's it, it's a process one of the things that gets them so uh you know um a little bit more educated is i you know i live in a co-housing most of my staff many of my staff has lived in this co-housing community at one time or another and all of them come to dinner on occasion you know and sit with everybody including the seniors but i do that because um i want them to i encourage that and cook dinner on occasion too i want them to see you know um you know the the setting what why we're doing this and what we're doing ma'am um uh, uh, this may be totally inappropriate but i'll take advantage of the fact that so many people here i first heard about um what you people seem to call co-housing with michael enright when he um spoke about the baba yaga project in paris france and uh that's is the, the the model that i would aim towards it seems to me that everyone here has a fair amount of some kind of capital that they can invest in that more power to you but um i don't choose to live that way and um i can't believe that i'm the only person who's concerned about this so um i don't know if there's any way that i could start a list i'm just putting this out to the audience i don't know if you are aware of this process um but it's it the, this 85 year old woman apparently had to fight and fight with the french but she finally got whatever people were responsible for this uh, particular function in paris to give her money and she started uh, a cooperative i would call it because i don't know how else to name it and everyone gave brought their gifts and money was the last sort of consideration because it was a state or provincial whatever term uh, responsibility but they found that ultimately it was economically extremely viable because you didn't have to call in the 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 institutional people that you spoke about in regard to your mother and others it was people with skills i have a skill for cooking she has a skill for housekeeping so we work together and and it seems to work and that's what i was hoping to hear something about yeah you know i any you know first of all there's Lots of co-housing groups get started up with meetup, you know, that's the the new thing that the the digital means of getting it started and I think the Vancouver group used the meetup a, a little bit when they first started. And you're sure there's lots of interest groups who um often start up, you know, vegetarians co-housing and, you know, pet lover co-housing and all that stuff. But um it doesn't take long to figure out two things. One is the more selective you get the fewer your audience the less likely you're going to succeed and um to that the broader you are the more real you are from a um you know from a uh you know a life experience point of view too so i mean anybody who wants to start a co-housing i mean i just recommend that you 
um, you know, just start it. You know, whatever your interests are. You know, we did a project a few years ago with all Methodists, and that worked out for a while, but then a couple houses sold, and they weren't Methodists, and everybody was fine with it, so it was fine. Yeah. Sir. I'm a general contractor, and I'd love to build uh, co-housing projects for the rest of my life. And I'm just wondering, what could you recommend a builder, how could a builder best service this group? That's a good question. I mean, thank you for being a builder who wants to make co-housing. Why not? <laughs> um, whoa! It, <laughs> Lauren. Cool. Um, well, stay connected. Um, uh, you know, you know, there's a project groundbreaking for Vancouver co-housing is June second, right? Isn't that Monday? Wait, June second? Oh, June eighth. June eighth. Oh, oh, a couple weeks later now. Okay. Anyway. I would go to, frankly, if I were in your, you know, my dad was a contractor, I, um, you know, and getting involved with this from an architect's point of view, you know, mentoring anyway. You're a general contractor? Yeah. So, I mean, I, first thing I'd do is I'd call this, uh, the developer, which is, there's a, there's a development team who's, um, uh, who's working with this co-housing group and say, hey, is there any room for whatever you, your specialty is? And if not, you know, look at uh, future projects around. Um, go see what they're doing in uh, Yarrow Eco Village, a project that's 33 unit project, just uh, about finished, about 90% finished. You know, Alan Carpenter, um, his wife spoke here today. He's a phenomenal guy. He basically is the Canadian co housing network, if you don't know him. He's a contractor, frankly. And funny thing is, I don't think he intended to let this happen. You know, he was a retired contractor, and what he really wanted to do was get co housing projects started because he's very much believes just like I do, which is we can do a lot better. He used to make just, you know, McMansions, frankly, is what he did for a living. And retired from that because it didn't feed his soul. And, and then there were numerous co-housing projects that got started that couldn't afford, uh, you know, um, uh, to, to do Brand X. So he came out of retirement and he's building the one in Yarrow Eco Village right now. There's a new one just getting ready to start there this Saturday at 4 p.m. if anybody's interested there's a one hour get together for a new senior co-housing that's happening there in Yarrow just this side of uh, of Chilliwack and um, stay connected basically and work like hell like all the professionals I know who are involved in co-housing work too hard try not to do that anyway any other questions ma'am In situ, you know, leave them there and stuff. Of the 120 projects in the U.S., one of them were done like that, retrofit. You know, Katie and I try to finish projects in two to three years. Um, that project took seven years. That organic method is a lot harder. There were all people that moved in over time. End of the day, you know, people often ask me, Chuck, what's the common denominator for co-housers? And there is, there's only one common denominator. You know, it's, they used to ask me this all the time. You know, we'd be sitting in the hot tub, you know, in California. And you're sitting in the hot tub. And, and, you know, they would always say, you know, is there some spiritual thing going on here? What's going on here? Exactly. Anyway, um, I had to figure out an answer. What's the common denominator? And, um, and I, I came to the conclusion there's only one. And that is that these are folks who believe that their own personal life, unfortunately, I do think that Anne ran may have been correct, that we only do things for ourselves. And um, um, our own personal lives will be better, more easy, more convenient, more practical, more interesting, more fun, more healthy, all the rest, if I give cooperation with my neighbor the benefit of the doubt. That doesn't mean I will cooperate if I don't want to. I never will cooperate if I don't want to, frankly. But there turns out there's so many possibilities for making my life better by cooperating. For example, recently, you know, somebody ran around our co-housing knocking on people's doors saying, hey, I'm going to buy a pickup. Do you want to buy a pickup truck together? No. Hey, I'm going to buy a pickup. Do you want to buy it together? No, no, no. But the point is he gave it, he tried it. I mean, I think in a regular single family house, if you went knocking on all the doors, <laughs> seeing if you want to buy a pickup truck together, I mean, about 10 minutes before somebody called the cops for the most. 
So, um, and although um, we didn't buy one that time, um, you know, when I lived in Emeryville co-housing, we had two shared cars. It meant that no household had more than one car. Um, 34 households, we have one lawnmower. I mean, that list is hundreds of line items long. You know, if somebody in my co-housing proposed buying a second lawnmower, people would say, what are you, crazy? You know, I mean, why would we do that? So, um, it's... When you start to learn to cooperate, you learn that it, you know you can actually do a lot less. Does that answer your question? Did I get off track? Yes, sort of, but it's okay. okay, okay. One last question, sir. What's up? What about the turnover within the community? Like people die. Yeah. What? What do you do about community um, without with, about turnover in the community? Is the question yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not a big deal, honestly. I know, and I'm not just saying that because I'm a proponent of co-housing, and I don't know if it's happenstance or what, but a lot of folks um, are turn out to be great communitarians, but um, for one reason or another, didn't get involved with creating the co-housing community. The creating the co-housing community is pretty hard, and um, uh, you know they were lucky enough to get into a co-housing community after it was built. But as, and as you say, people die. You know most co-housing communities do something along the lines of have you come to a couple common dinners, a couple common work days, a couple common meetings. But for the most part, those group, those individuals choose the group. You know this is for me, uh, or you know I'd really like to do this. Um, I. I've only heard of one co-housing group that I know of that has, you know, they try to choose somebody, which I feel like never works. You know, it's like when you're in college and people said, oh, I love to wash the dishes. And then <laughs> turns out they don't. <laughs> so, um, you know, let them figure it out if it makes sense to them. But then, you know, we've had... You know, some of those have been some of our greatest communitarians. They come in, they've got all this puppy dog like energy. You know, I can't wait to get in there and make the garden happen. We have a new guy who just put a one acre of, of new soil under under plow, and he's got all kinds of energy. He hasn't been burned out by the whole development effort and all the rest. So it's been great, actually. It's been great. So, yeah, it's been fine. Hey, thank you.